Dobar dan svima, dobrodošli na još jedan podcast inicijative Znanstvenici za klimu Hrvatska. Danas ćemo razgovarati sa gospodinom Andrewom de Glišom, veleposlanikom Velike Britanije u Hrvatskoj, a neposredni povod za naš razgovor bit će Green Campaign Britanskog veleposlanstva i i COP26 koji se održava sljedeće godine u Glasgow. So, Mr. Daglish, good day to you and thank you for for taking time to uh, join us in, in this uh, short talk. Uh, so let's start with, uh, with the Green Campaign happening this week and related to that to uh, the British Embassy's activities, climate-related activities in Croatia. Sure, well thank you so much for having me here. It's great to talk to you um, and to, to work together on what is the top priority for the British government um, and I think for many governments around the world uh, in the medium to long term um, because whatever we're doing to tackle COVID, whatever we're doing about our future relationship with the European Union, um, all of this pales into insignificance um, compared to the threat of dangerous climate change. So this really is a top priority uh, for my government and therefore it's a top priority for my embassy as well. And this week uh, we're trying to focus minds, focus everyone's attention uh, on this top priority uh, by having a series of events um, to engage different people, including scientists um, for climate change, um, including the general public at large, um, to uh, raise the issue of how climate change is a serious threat to the way that we all uh, live uh, and how solving climate change is a shared responsibility. It's not just a problem uh, caused by governments that needs to be solved by governments. It's a problem that's been caused by our uh, individual needs, behaviours, uh, and that we together as individuals need to take action to do something about it. So what are we doing? I'm going to have to look at my list because we've got so many um, activities on this week uh, that it's keeping us very busy and I can't remember them all. Uh, but one of them is this conversation with you um, to, to uh, share thoughts uh, on this. Um, uh, I've already been talking to um, uh, Dunja Mazoko Durvar, um, the, the former weather forecaster and now climate uh, activist, um, about um, different thoughts on, on what we might do as individuals um, to, to tackle climate change. That interview should be coming out uh, before too long. Um, we're talking to young Croatian activists, um, uh, Laura Škala, for example, um, who's uh, got connections with the UK, uh, but is very engaged and interested in, um, uh, in climate activity. Uh, on Thursday, um, we will be hosting a panel with the um, French ambassador, the Italian ambassador, uh, with Dunja again. Many people um, who are engaged and in, interested in um, climate uh, action. Um, and we'll be doing that live uh, online. Um, it coincides with the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and it also coincides with the Climate Ambition Summit that the UK and France and the United Nations are holding, where we're encouraging countries really to do the best they can uh, to state uh, their ambition for, for tackling climate change. Um, we will be, um, uh, you will see uh, out and about if you're in Zagreb, uh, the number 13 tram will become um, a COP26 tram. The point being to catch people's eye, uh, to make this something that is everyday and real, um, and by putting it on an electric tram, uh, we're making a statement uh, as well about our 
um, transport choices. Um, there are other things as well. I've gone on far too long, but you can see we're busy. Uh, you'll find us um, online or in person um, pushing this forward. Okay, thank you. So we encourage our viewers and listeners to check your social media and website to check about the schedules. And let's move on to, to COP26, which is uh, the 26th uh, UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties, which will be held in Glasgow next year, next November, uh, and is hosted by the UK in partnership with Italy. So can you tell us a little bit about COP, what is it and what is its significance in general? The, the COP is the body um, that is born out of the, the Climate Change Framework Agreement. Um, uh, this is the 26th meeting of it. Uh, and it's the body with responsibility for bringing all the members together um, to um, decide what action uh, and what action needs to be taken and the ways in which it can be taken uh, globally so that we have a framework in place um, that says we're all in this together we are all going to suffer from climate change and therefore we need an agreed approach um, about reducing the gases that are producing da dangerous climate change and also about supporting those countries who will be most impacted um, by climate change, most at risk from climate change uh, and how they're going to adapt to face the challenges. It's one of the sad truths that uh, the countries uh, most likely to suffer the consequences of climate change are very often those countries that have done the least to cause it uh, and there's a point of natural justice in there about how we uh, come together to do that so the COP is the place where that happens those negotiations happen um, if you remember uh, back in the 1980s we became aware of a growing hole in the ozone layer um, because of human activity which was causing uh, already causing damage had the potential to cause even more damage and we got together and with the Montreal uh, agreement put in place a framework um, that changed human behaviour and we're seeing now has begun to heal the hole in the ozone layer. Well, that's one body looking after that. This COP is the body looking after climate change uh, and bringing together um, countries. Um, hopefully, uh, our ambition is that COP26 will be the country that converts the Paris Agreement into real concrete action um, so that we re are reducing to net zero ultimately our emissions of carbon. Uh, so uh, this is a nice cue for my next question. Uh, so if we, uh, uh, we know that the last special report of the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change uh, sets an ambitious goal for reducing climate, ch climate change to an acceptable level. Of, uh, but uh, this goal is more ambitious than, than the one stated in the Paris Agreement, one of two uh, degrees. So, can we expect from uh, can we expe expect from this COP26 the revision of the Paris Agreement when it comes to the temperature rise goals or curbing uh, the temperature rise, global temperature well, rise? Let, let's be clear about the Paris Agreement. Um, uh, it commits to not allowing temperatures to rise above two degrees. Mm -hmm. But it also says that there's um, uh, an ambition to make sure they don't rise above 1.5. So that's in the Paris Agreement already. Um, and of course, um, that is definitely the ambition of the United Kingdom. We do not want to see um, temperatures rising above 1.5. And again, to be clear about this, it's not because one number is better than another. What our scientists are telling us, our, what you're telling us, our, the, the community of scientists are telling us in the IPCC, um, is that we can expect certain consequences to be related to certain temperature rises. And if we see a temperature rise of more than two degrees, the consequences are going to be catastrophic. If we can keep temperature rise to within two degrees, there will be consequences. We can see them already, um, but they will be less bad. If we can keep temperature rise to 1.5, then there will be consequences but it will be less bad. Um, so the UK is very committed to focusing on that 1.5 um, degree rise. Uh, and that's what we hope these pledges that are being made uh, will achieve. And to that end, um, in the UK, we announced last week that we would be cutting our carbon emissions by 68% by 2030. 
compared to 1990 levels and we would deliver that by 2030 mm -hmm. that's in 10 years time um, with a view to being carbon neutral by 2050 um, we're the first major economy to make such a, a significant um, commitment like that and it's because we believe you can have economic growth and we can have prosperity whilst at the same time reducing our impact on the environment uh, okay, thank you. So we see that the let's uh, let's um, uh, now switch to to uh, uh, specifically to the UK. Uh, last year, the UK declared climate emergency. Uh, it was the first uh, the first country to do so, and this was followed this year by by New Zealand. Uh, which are moves we welcome and finally this is also one of the main requests of our plea for systematic climate action that we address to the Croatian government. Uh, what does this mean in practice in the context of the UK and what steps has the UK taken after declaring uh, climate emergency? Uh, in practice what it means is that um, like if you have any kind of emergency um, all of your attention is focused on that. Uh, I don't mean that we stop doing other things but I mean that whenever we consider a policy that we are implementing, whenever we consider a choice to be made about um, transport or about um, whatever it might be, we are considering the climate impact. So climate emergency basically says uh, that um, throughout all of the policies that we're developing, we're considering whether there is damage to uh, the climate by implementing a policy in that way and if so can we find another way of achieving the same goals that reduces the carbon emissions uh, that we're making um, so this is something in other words that belongs to the whole of government it's a whole of government responsibility it's not just the department of environment that is left to figure out how to solve the problem of climate change it's the department of um, industry uh, it's the treasury our finance ministry um, it's the Foreign Office. We have commitments here in the Foreign Commonwealth uh, and Development Office uh, to be reducing our uh, emissions too. Um, important when it comes to travel, for example. Um, so uh, it's a cross-government um, uh, responsibility uh, and it's something that features in, in all our policy decision making. We're not always going to get it right, um, but it's at the forefront of, um, of all the decision making. So in practice, what we figured out, um, uh, and you'd be entitled to say that we could have figured it out a bit quicker because it seems fairly obvious, but what we figured out is that everybody in government, every ministry will agree that climate change is a terrible thing and something must be done about it. But then they'll explain to you that that something has to be done by somebody else because it's too difficult. If I'm in the Ministry of Transport, it's too difficult to deal with transport emissions. So yes, Carbon emissions should go down, but you can't touch transport. Or if you're in uh, the Ministry of uh, Energy, yes, carbon emissions are important, but you can't touch energy because it's very expensive to do anything. And you can have that conversation nonstop. What we did in the UK was to say, all right, we will have an annual budget of carbon. I don't mean money. I mean, we will say um, that we will have X amount, whatever X is, of uh, carbon that we allow ourselves to emit in a year and once we figured out that overall budget you can't spend more than that so everybody is going to have to figure out the role that they play to meeting that budget and year on year the budget will get smaller uh, that's why we have for example taken the uh, decision to ban the sale of petri petrol or diesel uh, powered cars um, by 2030 uh, that's a significant change to make uh, in a short space of time. But if you don't send those signals to the markets, then the markets will continue to supply what they've always supplied. This is saying to them, you won't be able to supply them anymore, not to the UK. We're not the first country to have done this. Um, uh, others have taken this action as well. Um, but you send clear signals to the market uh, and the market responds. Uh, so that's how we can begin to construct something as ambitious as 68% reductions by 2030. Uh, so uh, this more uh, more uh, encompassing and more interdisciplinary, so to speak, uh, uh, action toward uh, combating climate change is also in the center of the activities of the cl climate movement in the last years, which is 
a growing movement which is becoming more vocal and more diverse, especially the younger generations are taking initiative with Greta Thunberg and, and her school for uh, school, school strike for climate as the most recognizable figure and uh, metaphor. So in your view, can we, going coming back to, to COP26, can we expect that uh, the demands of the climate movement, which are most clearly articulated in these protests, in these global protests of the younger generation, be put to the fore in combating climate change? I very much expect them to be put to the fore. I, I think that it's impossible to ignore um, uh, that voice. Uh, it's the voice of the next generation. You know, we're here on this planet holding it in trust. That, that, that's not the legal term in English, but it means that we don't own it. We're enjoying the benefit of it at the moment, but as long as we are looking after it so that future generations can be the beneficiaries uh, as well. Um, uh, and that's a really important thing to remind ourselves uh, about, that we're stewards uh, of this planet, not just for our own good, but for the good of future generations as well. And those future generations, as you say, are making it very clear um, that they want us to take action to protect their future. Uh, and I believe, personally, we have a moral obligation to do that. This isn't a question of political choice, it's a moral obligation. Um, we can see the climate is changing in a way that risks being dangerous. We can do something about it now to stop that. Um, and therefore, we should. There's no discussion or debate about this. Um, so that voice from those climate activists is being heard um, and will be loud and clear uh, at uh, COP26. Um, the point is uh, that the message is being heard um, by progressive uh, governments, by governments like that of the UK, by the European Union, um, by others around the world. Um, and now what we have to do having got the Paris Agreement there, which is basically the framework that says, this is how we can make this thing work. This is how we can do it. What we need is to populate that agreement with concrete commitments from countries saying, we will take this action to deliver this. Um, and I believe that that's effectively delivering what the climate activists want. It's doing it in a relatively short time frame. Everybody would like it to be solved overnight. It's not going to be solved overnight. It takes long term commitment. Um, but I believe that can be achieved at Glasgow, in Glasgow at COP26. Yeah, we all hope. We all hope for that. And speaking of the EU, um, uh, since um, uh, what, is, what is the UK's position with regards to the European Green New Deal after Brexit? Well, we don't have a position on the Green Deal. That's, that's the business of the European Union. We've already left the European Union. Um, we're speaking in a, a week of intensive negotiations about our future relationship <clears throat> with the European Union. Um, but like any uh, sovereign state or any body, uh, collective body of states, um, we will figure out the best way of being able to deliver uh, our uh, prosperity, um, looking after our citizens, uh, and in the long term, that means in a way that reduces carbon emissions. Uh, so uh, the UK will be as supportive as you would expect uh, us to be of any action to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, and if the EU is doing that with the Green Deal, then fantastic. That, that's, um, we will do nothing but applaud. Um, our relationship with the Green Deal um, will all depend on our relationship um, with the European Union in the future. And given that that discussion is going on now, it's difficult for me to say. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deglish, uh, for this uh, short talk. Um, our time is uh, slowly coming to an end. And thank you to all our viewers. And uh, I hope we all uh, continue with our missions to combat climate change and putting science to, to, to the fore of it. Thank well, you thank again. You. Thank you very much indeed. I agree heartily with that uh, last sentiment. Uh, and please do, uh, I encourage your viewers to look out for the British Embassy. Um, Facebook page is a, is a great way of keeping track of what we're doing and getting involved. Uh, we're really keen to, to get people involved with this. We've got lots planned for the year ahead, so do stay in touch. Thank you again Thank you. and have a good day.